Um, <laughs> this isn't going to be a lecture about the making of The Shining per se. It took us nearly a thousand pages in the book to tell that story, so there's no way I can cover everything in, in just an hour. Um, but what I am going to talk about is how I became obsessed with The Shining uh, in the first place and the four decade journey that led me to ultimately create this book. Um, I'm also going to share a whole bunch of pictures and stories that I uncovered that I found really, really interesting. And finally, I'm going to give you a closer look at the, uh, the collector's edition from Tashin. So The Shining was first released in theaters in the uh, summer of 1980. Um, I was 12 years old. I was almost 13. I first saw the movie, not in Westwood, but in a shopping mall outside Cleveland. You'd think that I'd remember more about the first time that I saw the movie that ended up being such a huge part of my life. Um, but the only thing that I do remember is my mom turning to me at some point and asking if I was okay. Because she was nervous because two years earlier she had taken me, after I begged, to go see this another scary movie called It Lives Again, the sequel to It's Alive. And it had literally given me a solid year of nightmares. So she was a little gun shy. But I do remember answering that I was fine. Mm. And I was actually more than fine. I was transfixed. Mm. So a few days later, um, on the way to summer camp, thank you, we stopped at a gas station. And I ran in to buy a snack. And I spotted a yellow paperback um, with the movie poster on the front. And this is that very copy <clears throat> that I bought that day, which I still own. And it's really beat up because I read it about a billion times. Mm -hmm. And I noticed right away that the story was kind of different than the movie, but I still loved it just as much in its own way. I didn't get to see The Shining again for a really long time, so instead I just lost myself in the book. And I loved spending time back in the Overlook Hotel. I waited for what felt like forever, and The Shining finally came out on home video. But, unfortunately, it was a rental-only deal. So I blew a ton of money renting it over and over. <laughs> now eventually a for sale version came out and I could finally buy what was quickly, quickly shaping up to be my favorite movie. I pretty much wore the tape out watching it again and again, showing it to all my friends who hadn't seen it. And yes, it was on Betamax. <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle of my paperback were eight pages of film scenes. <laughs> And I spent a lot of time looking at those film scenes. At some point, though, I noticed something weird. One of the photos of Wendy cooking in the kitchen, it wasn't a scene I remember being in the movie. So I went back to my tape and I shuttled it all over the place, but that shot was nowhere to be found. And I thought, wait a minute. If this scene wasn't in the film, could there be others? And it was around then that I had heard a rumor about a scene that took place in a hospital that had been cut off the end of the movie right after it opened. And I started obsessing over it, mm. trying to figure out how I could learn more about that hospital scene. I think I really just craved more of the movie that I loved. Mm. So I thought maybe I could find a screenplay. Surely the hospital scene would be in that. So I found this mail order script company and they said they had a screenplay of The Shining. So I plunked down my 25 bucks or whatever, and it finally showed up in my mailbox. And I immediately flipped to the end, but there was no hospital scene. Sad trombone. <laughs> it turned out that this was a post-production script. It was an exact transcription of the film, but it was made after the hospital scene had already been removed. Now, at some point, I started wondering who the Stanley Kubrick guy was, who was the director. <laughs> I thought, well, did he make any other movies? <laughs> so I started renting Kubrick's other movies and I noticed something interesting. I felt like there were these like reverse echoes of The Shining running through his earlier films. The photography, the music, the pacing, even like how the actors said their lines. And it was then that I realized, I think for the first time, that being a director kind of meant being an artist. Because before The Shining, movies were just entertainment to me. But now I started to see them as something more. I saw them as um, a kind of art that had the director's own taste and vision and imagination all throughout. I didn't realize it at the time, but the seeds of me wanting to make my own movies had been planted. Several years later, when I arrived at USC's film school, 
I visited their library, which included a huge collection of screenplays, and you can bet I immediately asked for The Shining. <laughs> but the only script they had wasn't even really a script. It was an early treatment, just like a collection of scenes, really, one per mm. page. But it was fascinating because there were moments that I knew weren't in the film. There were references to a scrapbook, something that I knew was in Stephen King's novel, but it wasn't in the movie. And the treatment also had this really weird climax where Wendy killed Jack, and then Dick Halloran showed up at the Overlook and he tried to murder Wendy and Danny. It was crazy. So instead of getting the answers I was looking for, I just had more questions. <laughs> <laughs> So a lot went on for me the next 20 years. I started my career, I got married, we started a family, and through it all, my obsession with The Shining just grew and grew. And when the internet became a thing, I, I searched and found new articles and interviews and some behind the scenes photos that I'd never seen before. There just wasn't much, and most of the pictures were kind of cruddy, low quality. And there definitely was no hospital epilog out there. And then, in 1999, I heard on the news that Stanley Kubrick had died. He had died while finishing his latest film. And when I saw Eyes Wide Shut, as the final credits scrolled off the screen, my eyes welled up because that was it. There would be no more Stanley Kubrick films. A few years after Stanley died, the Kubrick family opened up his archives for the first time. And a bunch of items were curated into Stanley Kubrick, the exhibition, mm. a museum show that's still traveling the globe after 20 years with no plans to stop. And then in 2005, Tashin published a giant coffee table book called the Stanley Kubrick Archives. And I bought it immediately, of course. And I flipped right to the section on The Shining. <laughs> I, was, I just remember being beside myself with what I was about to see. I saw photo after photo and document after document that I had never seen before. And I knew this had to be just the tip of the iceberg of what existed in the rest of Stanley's boxes. I remember feeling white hot jealousy for the people who got to go through Stanley's boxes and curate all this amazing stuff because I knew there was no way in hell I'd ever get to. <laughs> and then this last page stopped me in my tracks. After 25 years, a glimpse of the deleted hospital epilogue. Three black and white continuity Polaroids. It wasn't much, but it was more than I'd ever seen. It was an oasis after a long crawl through a hot desert. <laughs> Around the same time, I started a blog to gather all the little shining tidbits that I've been collecting over the years. I figured if there was just one person out there who was as big a fan as I was, maybe they'd enjoy it. Stuff like this picture, which seemed like a publicity still, but again, it wasn't in the movie. Was it a deleted scene? Was it just staged? I could only guess. A few years after the Kubricks <laughs> opened Stanley's archives, they decided to donate everything to the London College of Communication. They wanted to establish a permanent archive where scholars and students could learn from what Stanley had left behind. I became obsessed with visiting, of course. So when I was finishing up directing Toy Story 3, I reached out to a guy named Richard Daniels, who was the chief archivist at the time. I told him I'd be passing through London on my press tour, and I asked if I could visit the archive. I also invited him to the London premiere of Toy Story 3, which I figured couldn't hurt. <laughs> so in July of 2010, having finished all my Toy Story 3 press, I found myself at the doors of the Stanley Kubrick archive. This is the reading room at the archive, obviously inspired by the vibe of 2001. <laughs> On the other side of the wall to the left is a massive room that's filled with all of Kubrick's archives. I scanned through the catalog and then I started requesting boxes. I spent three days in this room, three days, and I was only able to scratch the surface of everything that they had from The Shining. I was a kid in the candy store. I'm gonna show you some random things that I saw that day that kind of blew my mind. Hmm. And you're not actually allowed to photograph anything in there, but I was later given permission. That's why I this. <laughs> so they had the original box of Jack's typing paper, the exact one seen in the movie, all 114 pages hand typed. And I remember thinking that I, I, I somehow never noticed that the pages were actually yellow, not white. I never thought about that, hmm. and I never noticed it in the film. They had the actual framed photo of Jack from the final shot in the film. 
Some of the things that Stanley chose to keep in his archive mm. are strangely random, mm. like this distributor cap that when he <laughs> discovers Jack has severed, disabling the snow cat. <laughs> they also had this prop scrapbook. Now, by this time, I had figured out that a scrapbook had been a part of Kubrick's film. It had just been deleted for some reason. I had noticed, watching the film again and again, that there was this scrapbook lying open on Jack's writing table, but it was never referenced. It wasn't part of the story. When I looked through the prop scrapbook that they have in the archive, I expected there to be articles about the history of the Overlook, but there weren't any. Instead, there were only old newspaper clippings from vintage newspapers. Although there was this one page that had a handwritten note, kind of a line lifted right out of Stephen King's novel. <laughs> What I did find were a bunch of drafts of newspaper articles about the Overlook, as well as some articles that had been actually laid out and printed on newsprint, but these were just kind of remnants. The scrapbook actually used in the movie was nowhere to be found. <laughs> now, if you believe everything you read about The Shining on the internet, <laughs> you know that Stephen King wrote his own screenplay for The Shining, that, but Kubrick arrogantly never bothered to read it. That's if you believe everything you read on the internet. It's because it turns out that the archive indeed had a copy of Stephen King's screenplay, and it was filled with handwritten notes in Stanley's distinctive handwriting. So he did read it, and then he chose to write his own screenplay. So, so much for that rumor. And that's just one of dozens of apocryphal stories about The Shining that I eventually learned were either false or at least extremely exaggerated. I found this weird poem card. It read, there is no life. Lifelessness is only a disguise behind which hide unknown forms of life. I had absolutely no idea what it was. And I actually found it in multiple languages. Hmm. They also had a copy of the galleys for King's novel. I was surprised to find that it was originally titled The Shine. Hmm. Huh. The galleys were covered with Stanley's handwritten notes. They revealed Kubrick's first reactions to every aspect of King's novel, the things he liked, the things he didn't like. Here, Stanley notes, with amusement perhaps, the fact that his initials and Stephen King's initials, SK, were the same. <laughs> he also noted that the hotel that inspired King's novel was the Stanley Hotel. <laughs> Later, he noted that Jack Nicholson, who was already considering to play Jack Torrance, shared the same first name as the character he'd play and that Liv Ullman, who was an early idea for the role of Wendy, mm. shared the same last name as the hotel manager, Stuart Ullman. Now, it's no accident that Kubrick was noting these things and noticing these things. He and screenwriter Diane Johnson had read and discussed Sigmund Freud's 1919 essay on the uncanny. There are several theories in Freud's essay that I'm convinced Kubrick made use of in The Shining. And one of those is that unexplained repetition of words or numbers in someone's life can give them an uncanny feeling. On the title page of King's published novel, now called The Shining, Kubrick wrote uncanny at the top of the page. And he sketched out ideas for how he could use repeating numbers. He was playing with the number 217, the haunted room in the novel that he later changed to room 237. On a related note, I also found this letter from the Timberline Lodge in Oregon, the hotel that Kubrick used as inspiration for the exterior of the Overlook. Um, and in it, the manager asked Kubrick to change room 217 to a different number because they had a room 217. And he was worried that guests would be too scared to stay, stay in it after seeing the movie. So Stanley wrote back, letting him know that they changed it to room 237. Cool. But why room 237? Why not any other number? Well, let's look at some uncanny number repetition in The Shining. Hmm. At the beginning of the movie, Danny wears a shirt with the number 42 printed prominently on the sleeve. Later, Wendy's watching a movie on the TV in the hotel lobby. Could have been any movie, but it's the summer of 42. Hmm. Huh. Now back to room 237. Why did Kubrick pick that number over any other? Well, maybe because, maybe, two times three times seven, is 42. And finally, the date on the photo in the final shot. Why 1921? Why not any other year in the 20s? Well, maybe, because if you double 21, you get 42. Now wait, wait. <laughs> Before you think that I'm like just another crazy person overanalyzing the shine, 
these were choices. These were choices, and rather than just being random choices, I think Stanley was having some fun, even if just for himself. It's clear from all evidence that Kubrick was thinking about how to make his audience, even subconsciously, feel uncanny feelings. All right, enough of that, back to the archive. I also looked through a bunch of drafts of the screenplay and finally discovered this, the deleted hospital uh, epilogue. Mm. <laughs> it was no longer just this vague idea of a scene. Here was the actual scene in front of me in black and white. I was also really excited to find many envelopes like this that were filled with black and white negatives shot during the production. A few of the pictures I'd seen before, but most of them were brand new to me, and seeing them was intoxicating. There were also notebooks stuffed with black and white continuity Polaroids. They were all shot on the set by script supervisor June Randall, and they were used to track a bunch of things in each scene, what actors were wearing, how their hair was styled, how props were dressed, etc. And there were hundreds and hundreds of them. On my last day in the archive, I started looking through some notebooks that I had requested from cold storage. They took a day or so to come up to room temperature, so I had to wait till my last day there to see them. They were filed under the name Rush's Assessment, which was a very unsexy name for the magnitude of what I discovered. <laughs> what they actually were were a set of notebooks that Kubrick used in the editing room so that he could quickly remind himself of all the different setups that he'd done for any given scene. For each slate, for each camera setup, Stanley had a few head frames trimmed out of the work print and filed in a notebook. And for moving shots or zoom shots, he'd have a few head frames and a few tail frames put in the notebook. And he could see at a glance if a shot ended differently than it started. But I then started noticing frames that I didn't recognize. Like, what's that shot of the TV? That's not in the movie. But since this seemed to be a moving shot, I surmised that Kubrick had actually started in a close-up of the TV and then slowly panned and zoomed to find Wendy and Danny. It's likely just one way that he decided to start the scene, potentially, which now starts with a simple cut to them sitting at the table. Then I flipped a few pages and I found this. Remember this? It's that black and white still in my paperback. The image that started my obsession. And here it was in full color. It was clearly a deleted scene that probably came just before we see Wendy rolling her breakfast cart through the hotel lobby. As I flipped through the pages, more and more was revealed. Never seen this before. Here Kubrick slowly zooms in on Danny as he stands by the hedge maze model in the lobby. At this point, I had no idea what it was or where it had meant to go in the, in the film. And then there were some really odd shots that were complete mysteries, like this one of the oversized hedge maze model that we see in the film, the kind of elaborate only in Jack's mind version of the maze. Except this one was made to look like it was encrusted with snow. And near the center was a tiny frozen Jack. So some of my questions were being answered, but new mysteries were popping up. And then, lo and behold, images of Jack finding the scrapbook. I'd long suspected that there had been more in the movie to do with the scrapbook, and here was the proof. Shot after shot of Jack obsessively looking through the scrapbook on his writing table. Now, as I approached the end of the notebook, my heart started racing because I was pretty <laughs> sure what I was gonna find. And then after 30 years of searching, there it was. The deleted hospital epilogue in living color. Well, faded color. <laughs> I was breathless. I could not believe what I'd found. And I didn't think anyone had seen these, at least not anyone who realized their significance. There was Danny playing near the nurse's station. There was Ullman sitting and talking to Wendy at her bedside. There was Wendy being told that nothing out of the ordinary had been found at the hotel, that it was all in her imagination. And finally, Danny catching a yellow tennis ball ominously tossed to him by Ullman. I was staggered. Listen, I, I know I hadn't discovered the secret to eternal life here, but for me and my obsessive 30-year quest, this moment was monumental. 
Now, after my incredible visit to the archive, I started thinking in earnest about the prospect of creating a book on the making of The Shining. There had been lots of critical analysis, but next to nothing had been written about the actual making of the film. So as I started working on what would ultimately become my film Coco, I decided to reach out to the Kubrick estate to gauge their interest in such a book. And so I sent this email to Jan Harlan, Stanley's brother-in-law, executive producer of The Shining, and spokesman for the Kubrick estate. I still didn't know exactly what form this theoretical book might take. Would it be text heavy, image heavy? I had no idea. But I did know that I had concerns that the photos in the archive wouldn't be enough. They were amazing, but they were kind of limited in scope. Jan got back to me and he was enthusiastic about doing a book. The problem was they had also just been approached by someone else interested in doing the same kind of book. <coughs> the estate couldn't support two similar books and so, and they also didn't want to have to pick one of us over the other. With a bit of sleuthing, I found out that a writer named J.W. Rinsler and his research partner, Brandon Allinger, were the folks that had approached the estate. Jonathan was the successful author of many prominent making of books, and he also happened to live in the San Francisco Bay Area where I lived. So after some introductory emails, he agreed to meet me for lunch one day at Pixar. We hit it off immediately, and we came to the conclusion that a partnership was in the cards. I'd never written a book before, but I had a ton of research and a few interviews under my belt. Jonathan definitely knew how to write a book, but he was starting with next to nothing. Jan was thrilled with the idea of us teaming up, so I hired Jonathan and we set off together on what would become an eight-year adventure. Now, two things needed to happen immediately. First, we needed to get our hands on the daily production reports from the Warner Brothers archive. These were vital for Jonathan to create a kind of a structural chronology and to determine exactly what had been shot each and every day during production. Second, we needed to track down the cast and crew of The Shining and interview them ASAP. The folks who had worked on the film were not getting any younger, and many, sadly, had already <laughs> passed away. Now, Jack Nicholson was obviously someone we were very, very interested in talking to. Despite my best efforts, however, Jack never agreed to be interviewed for the book. He notoriously rarely gives interviews. Despite that, I did manage to get my hands on two critical interviews that he had given about his time on The Shining. On his final day of shooting, Jack sat for a long interview for Vivian Kubrick's documentary on the making of the film, and I got a hold of the complete raw transcript of that interview. He also gave an extensive interview in 2009 to Empire Magazine as a favor to Steven Spielberg, who was guest editing the issue. Mm -hmm. And I got my hands on the complete raw transcript of that one as well. So between those two and a bunch of smaller interviews that he had given throughout the years, we were confident that Jack's voice would be all over the book. At the last minute though, Jack did grant me an opportunity to meet him. He wanted to meet at Madame Tussauds on Hollywood Boulevard, which I thought was kind of weird, but whatever. <laughs> I was just happy to finally get to meet him. <laughs> now, Shelley Duvall was obviously someone else we wanted to talk to. Shelley had left Hollywood in 1994 and returned to her home state of Texas. There were unfortunate rumors that Shelley was suffering from mental illness and had kind of become a recluse. Despite that, I was determined to find her, and I spent many years trying to track her down hit many dead ends. And then finally, in the summer of 2018, I met a good friend of Shelley's who offered to introduce me. And before I knew it, I was on the phone with her and she agreed to meet. So I hopped on a plane to Texas. Shelley and I met at her favorite restaurant, Red Lobster, <laughs> and we spent an entire day together reminiscing about her time on The Shining. Now, I need to pause here and note that at the same time I had my journalistic cap on, the 12-year-old in me was freaking the F out. <laughs> I showed Shelley photos that she'd never seen and videos of interviews that she'd given nearly 40 years ago. Her memories for making The Shining were vivid, and she was delighted to talk about work that she clearly was very proud of. Shelley also put to rest the constant rumors of her mistreatment at the hands of Kubrick. She conceded that the shoot was very challenging at times, given the intense performance the role demanded, and that she also didn't always agree with Stanley's methods. 
but she was adamant that she loved Stanley and her time making the film, and that she was very proud of the performance he had gotten out of her. It was an incredible day, and at the end, she didn't want me to leave. Aww. Now, the last primary cast member we needed to find was Danny Lloyd. Danny was only five years old when he was in The Shining, and he turned six during the production. He had vanished from the film industry after playing a young G. Gordon Liddy in a TV movie. It was the only other acting he ever did. Now, I'd heard rumors that Dan was a biology teacher at a community college in Kentucky, so I did what any good private detective would do. I started scouring the faculty list at every Kentucky community college <laughs> website I could find. And finally, one day, I found him and wow. his email address. Wow. So I wrote him a nice note, and then I crossed my fingers and hoped for the best. I didn't hear back from him for a very long time. And then finally, a reply landed in my inbox. Dan was polite, but he was wary of talking to me. He was living a private life, and he didn't want his work as a child actor to interfere with his career as a teacher. He was also very mindful of Stanley's privacy all these decades later. He wanted to make sure that the Kubrick family was okay with him talking to me. So Jan Harlan reached out on my behalf to vouch for the project. And with that, Dan opened up and agreed to an interview. <laughs> So I ended up interviewing Dan a couple of times on the phone, and later I visited him on his farm in rural Kentucky. He was kind and humble, and he had surprisingly clear memories of his time making The Shining, given how young he was. I mean, I can barely remember being five myself, but I think it must have been like such an unusual experience for him that many of those memories just stuck. And here's a really awesome thing that happened during my visit. Dan and I were walking around on his farm, and, uh, he was showing me around, his kids were with us, and my phone started buzzing in my pocket. And I was just gonna ignore it because I'm with, <laughs> with Danny Lloyd. I'm not gonna answer my phone. But I thought I better check, just make sure it's not an emergency or something. So I, I kind of lifted it out of my pocket and it was Shelly Duvall. Oh my. Oh my. So I had to answer it. <laughs> I answered the phone, I talked to Shelly for a bit. She, was, she had a question she was asking me. And then I said, Shelly, you're never gonna believe who I am standing here with. Wow. Danny. I said, do you want to talk to him? She did. So I handed my phone to Dan, and I got to witness Dan and Shelly having their first conversation since he was six years old. Wow. And I really wanted to take a picture of the moment, except Dan was on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to take a mental snapshot, so I'm unfortunately not able to share that moment with you. After I got Dan to open up, he started appearing at some local conventions, signing autographs for charity. I also saw that he had given an interview to a British newspaper, and in the article was this picture of him. He's holding a photo, and when I leaned in close, it seemed to be a picture of him on the nighttime hedge maze set, but I didn't recognize it. So I called him and I asked about it, and he said, oh yeah, it's just a picture I pulled out of my parents' photo album. <laughs> <laughs> I said, um, photo album? He said, yeah, my parents took a bunch of pictures while we were over in England doing the movie. Wow. He'd never mentioned any of this to me. I already knew I wanted to interview Dan's parents, who had both been with him during the shoot, and they were both still living, but now I really wanted to meet them. <laughs> So after a few phone calls with Dan's mom, Anne, I eventually headed to rural Illinois to meet her and her husband, Jim. They're both super nice, salt of the earth people, lovely Midwesterners. And they hadn't spoken to anyone about their family's experience since 1980. When I walked into their home, they took me to the kitchen where I saw a bunch of costumes and memorabilia that I instantly recognized. You can see Danny's Bugs Bunny shirt with the 42 on the sleeve, lying over a chair, wow. along with some other costumes from the film. Jim and Ann had a trunk in their basement where they had kept all of this memorabilia for decades. I also noticed an old photo of Danny that I'd never seen from his time on The Shining framed on the wall, and also this awesome family portrait, <laughs> which was from about a year before Danny was cast, and I knew instantly that it had to be in the book, and it is in the book. <laughs> That's Danny's brother, Mike, who was 14 when they all headed to England to make The Shining. Jim and Ann eventually pulled out their photo albums, there was more than one, and I started leafing through them. 
Page after page, I saw photos I'd never seen, photos that I knew no one outside the Lloyd family had ever seen. It turns out that Stanley had given Jim permission to take photos on the set. He just asked that the Lloyds never sell them to a newspaper or a magazine. This is pre-internet. <laughs> My jaw dropped as I saw photo after photo documenting aspects of the production that I knew had never been photographed. But the photos were all pretty faded, so I tentatively asked if they happened to have the negatives, and they did. <laughs> in that trunk in the basement were over 535 millimeter negatives, mostly color, some black and white. And I'm gonna show a few of them now. This is the Lloyd family on their first day visiting Elstree Studios, getting toured around the sets by Leon Vitale. Leon started with Kubrick as an actor, playing Lord Bullingdon and Barry Lyndon. And Stanley remembered how well Leon had worked with a child actor on that set, and so he asked Leon to be in charge of finding a little boy to play Danny. Danny Torrance. Danny, Danny. Leon never left Danny's side during the making of The Shining, coaching him and, and being the main li liaison to the Lloyd family. This is a scale model of the Overlook Hotel facade that was subsequently built on the back lot at Elstree. It's sitting in the art department, which was later dressed to be the Overlook's kitchen. This is the facade of the Overlook, which was nearing completion when the Lloyds arrived. Here's another angle after the facade was finished, which reveals that the hedge maze was also just a facade. The interior maze that Wendy and Danny explore was built at the old MGM studios down the road. And all the nighttime maze scenes at the end of the movie were shot indoors on a soundstage. That brick building in the background is a set of stages that housed the sets for the caretaker's apartment and all the adjacent hallways, including the one where Danny runs into the Grady twins while riding his trike. Jim also shot some photos while they were actually filming. And to me, those were golden. It was at that moment, looking through the Lloyd family photos, that I was finally confident that we could create a Tashin-worthy book. Now, Lisa and Louise Burns, who played the Grady twins, were also very difficult to find. You know what? Everyone was difficult to find. <laughs> They're now both on social media, at the Shining Twins. But when I was trying to find them, I had nothing to go on. So the hunt took me years. And then, there they were. This was the nice. day that I met them in person for the first time. We were at a 35th anniversary event at L Street that reunited a bunch of the cast and crew. Here's a group shot of all of us at the reunion. That's Diane Johnson, Stanley's co-writer, standing between the twins. And the tall guy in the back is Garrett Brown, the inventor of the Steadicam, which was used extensively for the first time on The Shining. Yes, he deserves applause. <laughs> this is me with the twins a couple of years later at a British pub after probably a little too much to drink. <laughs> they are a lovely, unique pair. They're as short as jockeys, and they talk really fast at the same time, and they're constantly finishing each other's sentences. The woman who transcribed all my interviews with them, I should have probably given her hazard pay. <laughs> I also met the girl's mother, Esne, who was with them on the set, and she, sh she shared several family photos, such as this portrait from around the time they were in The Shining. She also shared some amazing images from during the shoot, and most of them are in the book. Hanging with Lisa and Louise gave me many pinch me moments, including the morning I woke up on my birthday to find this message on my phone. Happy birthday. Happy birthday! We hope you have a really lovely day. Have a great birthday from the Shiny Twins. And remember, come and play with us forever and ever and ever. And ever. <laughs> Bye, Lynn. Bye. Happy birthday. It was also a great honor for me to meet and talk with the Kubrick family. Jonathan did all the initial interviews with Stanley's wife, Christiana, and with Jan Harlan, but I later got to visit the Kubrick estate, Chittickbury. This is me with Christiana in the family's enormous kitchen. Now, some of you may know, Christiana has long been a fine artist, and their home is filled with their paintings. And many of the same paintings can be seen in Tom and Nicole's apartment in Eyes Wide Shut. Those oh, are all wow. Christiana's paintings. Mm -hmm. 
When we were eating lunch, Yan casually pointed out that the table we were sitting at, their kitchen table, was Jack's writing table from The Shining. Oh, yeah. I think my pulse went up a bit. <laughs> That's Yan reading the paper, and at the table is Stanley's grandson, one of his grandsons, Jack. Jack. <laughs> Later, Yan took me over to his house and up to their guest bedroom. And in the bathroom was the bathtub and one of the sinks from room 237. Maybe the toilet too, I don't remember. He was remodeling his house around the end of production and he said it just made sense to take them home and repurpose them. <laughs> he, he didn't express the slightest nostalgia for what an iconic bit of film history they were. <laughs> Now, we uncovered a million interesting stories while researching the book, way more than I could ever tell here tonight, but I've picked a few that I found pretty interesting, and I, I hope you do too. When the Torrance family drives up to the Overlook, I figured the shot was some sort of rear projection shot, but no one I talked to seemed to remember much about it. Well, when I met Greg McGillivray, the second unit director who filmed The Shining's title sequence, he told me that he had visited Elstree a couple of times during the production and that Stanley had let him take a bunch of photos on the set, which Greg graciously shared with me. I love this one showing the VW Beetle that's been sawed in half. It was super interesting, but it didn't tell me where or how the scene was shot. Then I discovered this photo taken by Jim Lloyd. To my amazement, it revealed that Kubrick actually shot this scene on the Colorado lounge set. You can see the balcony behind the white screen. The VW Beetle shell is sitting right about where Jack's writing table normally sits. Jim also took shots of the rear projection setup. Here the background plate of the Colorado scenery is being projected onto a screen set up behind the car. This is a great example of how the Lloyd family photos proved absolutely invaluable to this project. Now you remember all those black and white images I found in the Kubrick archive? When I returned to scan them, I discovered that two of the rolls were labeled a little differently, and they had an SK written on them. And it occurred to me that perhaps Stanley himself had taken these photos. I checked the images, both these and this roll, and I saw that Stanley didn't appear in any of them, unlike any other roll of film. And with that, I uncovered a bunch of lost Stanley Kubrick photographs that no one, not even the archive, knew about. Here's a few of them. This is Jack and Shelley. They're in their costumes from the sequence where they're being toured around the hotel. But here, they're rehearsing the breakfast in bed scene. This is director of photography, John Alcott, checking some lighting. Alcott had worked with Kubrick since 2001, A Space Odyssey. When I look at these images, I feel like I can feel Stanley behind the camera. His eye for composition and his sense of kind of capturing the perfect moment. He'd been a professional photojournalist, of course, from the age of 17, and he carried that eye for the perfect frame through the rest of his career. Whoa, whoa. This is Billy Gibson, who played the old lady in room 237. A wardrobe assistant is combing Vaseline into her hair. <laughs> Nicholson would complain that he could not get the smell of the Vaseline out of his nose. Ooh. The man in the back in the glasses is Tom Smith, who designed her makeup. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Cigarette break. <laughs> now, Billy Gibson wasn't actually an actress. She was a fellow patient of the Kubrick's dentist. Oh, no. They had been looking for an older woman who wore dentures so that she could remove her teeth to play the part. Oh, my. <laughs> Billy's dressing room was right next to Danny's, and Anne Lloyd's biggest fear was that her son would see Billy in this makeup. Thankfully, he never did. Now, on that note, another one of those internet rumors that you see claims that Danny never even knew he was in a scary movie the whole time he was filming. Hmm. Not true. He knew full well it was a scary movie. He was just never scared because filming a scary movie is not necessarily scary. The only time Dan remembers feeling at all uncomfortable was when Stanley was playing some music from Jaws to get him in the right mood. <laughs> so Stanley stopped, and he never did that again. Oh. 
all. I found the, uh, these among the Lloyd family photos. Apparently right across the street from L Street was the studio where the Muppet Show was, was uh, taped. And on a day off, Danny and his mom watched them create the show and then got to go backstage to where all the Muppets were stored. <laughs> when I saw these, it was like two completely disparate parts of my childhood got smashed together into something surreal and wonderful. So, of course, you remember the outtake frames I discovered in the archive. Well, it turns out they were in pretty bad shape. They were faded and dusty, and they had scratches all over the emulsion. After I scanned them at super high resolution, the retouching team was able to work wonders. Nice. Oh, Jesus. I still cannot believe I found these images. They were truly my white whale. Here are a few other restored outtake frames. The making breakfast scene from my paperback. I love that she's watching Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> What does that mean? Everyone's wondering. <laughs> Here's that shot of Danny by the maze model. I later learned that there was a deleted scene where Danny and Wendy looked at the model before going out to explore the real maze. Mm. The shot was a long, slow zoom in on Danny's face, where Co which Kubrick filmed with the intention of Danny having some kind of a scary vision. Mm. Now in the finished film, when Jack's been locked in the larder, we hear the voice of Grady outside the door. The conversation plays out, but we never see Grady. Well, I discovered that Kubrick actually shot Grady's side of the conversation. Hmm. I suspect he didn't use it to keep the scene more ambiguous about whether it was Grady was actually real. A lot of Stanley's omissions had to do with keeping things more ambiguous and not spoon feeding the audience. Mm -hmm. In the scene where Danny and Wendy explore the maze, they originally got to go to the center and Wendy took a Polaroid of Danny. The twins were on the set that day in costume because Stanley was considering having Danny see them in the maze, but he didn't end up shooting anything with them. Now, if you look at Danny's hip, he has some kind of a toy pistol in a holster. In the script, Danny had a toy phaser that we'd see him with throughout the film. And Kubrick's original conception was that at the end of the film, when Jack chases Danny into the hedge maze, Danny would grab a mallet and start smashing out all the lights. He would eventually plunge the maze into darkness trapping his father, and then used his phaser toy, which was a flashlight, to light his way back out. Hmm. Well, Kubrick eventually scrapped that and came up, of course, with the idea of Danny walking backwards through his own footsteps. But because Stanley had already filmed several scenes before he made that change, there are echoes of the idea left behind in the finished film. Hmm. Here in a shot from the final film, if you take a look at the table, hmm. there's the phaser. It was actually a toy from the original Star Trek series. <laughs> And in the scene where Wendy and Danny explore the maze, there's the phaser in a holster on his hip. There were also other ghostly echoes of abandoned ideas left behind in the finished film. As I mentioned earlier, a scrapbook would mis mysteriously appear on Jack's writing desk. And here, Kubrick and Alcott are setting up a low angle shot of Jack looking through the scrapbook. And here's the shot as it would have appeared in the film had the whole idea not been cut. But again, since Stanley didn't make the decision to abandon the scrapbook idea until after much of the film had already been shot, ghostly echoes are left behind. It's clear that Kubrick framed this shot to emphasize the control the scrapbook and the hotel was already having over Jack. This was Danny's very last shot on his final day of filming. It was another moment where Kubrick slowly zoomed in while Danny had some sort of frightening vision. He didn't know what those visions were gonna be when he filmed these moments. The script would just say something like, Danny has a horrific vision. <laughs> Kubrick would figure that out later. <laughs> when they were filming Wendy and Danny exploring the hedge maze, Gary Brown realized that Danny Lloyd weighed about the same as his camera rig. <laughs> so he removed the camera and fashioned a sling for Danny to sit in. Garrett would glide around the set with Danny in the sling and Danny would be laughing hysterically the whole time. They dubbed it the Steady Danny, <laughs> and Dan it. still remembers riding around in it. Wow. Remember that odd poem card I found? Well, I eventually learned what it was for. Originally, at the end of the scene with Grady in the red bathroom, Grady handed a mysterious card to Jack. Kubrick himself shot the insert handheld over Jack's shoulder. And here's that shot as it would have appeared in the film. After seeing the card, we then cut back to Jack only to discover that Grady and the mysterious card had vanished.
That's how the scene originally ended. Mm -hmm. On the evening of January 24th, 1979, Kubrick and his crew were filming this shot when a stagehand burst in shouting that there was a fire on the adjacent soundstage. Stage three, the enormous soundstage that housed the Colorado lounge set was rapidly becoming a raging inferno. There was massive chaos, but luckily everyone got out without injuries. There's a big section in the book about the fire and its aftermath, but here's one little tidbit that I loved. The actor who played the injured guest was named Norman Gay. On Elstree's sound mixing stage, they were mixing an unrelated project when suddenly Norman burst into the room and he asked if he could hide out there for a while. And they said, sure, but why? Norman told them about the fire and said he needed to hide out because the firefighters, seeing his gashed head, kept trying to load him into an ambulance and take him <laughs> to the hospital. Oh. The next morning, Jim Lloyd took some photos of the fire's aftermath. There was really nothing to see but a bunch of twisted, smoldering wreckage. The entire stage and that beautiful lounge set inside had burned to the ground. Photographer Murray Close captured this image. Stanley laughing among the debris. <laughs> Kubrick actually took the fire very seriously, though luckily they had finished shooting pretty much everything on that lounge set. It didn't need to be completely rebuilt, as is often misreported. You remember this image from my Overlook Hotel website? Well, I eventually learned about the scene that it came from. Originally, after the scene where Wendy runs out of the lounge carrying a catatonic Danny, there were shots of her running through the hallways and then finally into the caretaker's apartment where she hugged Danny on his bed. And here's Kubrick filming that shot. The scene went on to have Jack show up at the door demanding to be let in. Jack pounded at the door with more and more rage before finally storming off and going to the gold ballroom where he first meets Lloyd, the bartender. And this is another deleted shot from that scene. Danny writes red rum on the bathroom door and lipstick as we head into the climax of the film. To get ready for that scene, Leon Vitale had Danny practice writing the word over and over in his dressing room. The Lloyds shared with me a big stack of paper that Danny had practiced writing wow. on. Some in pen, some in lipstick, like this one. A lot of people think that this is just a dummy of Jack frozen to death at the end of the movie. Sorry, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie. I actually wondered about it myself for a long time. I could never quite decide if it was really Nicholson or not but new photos revealed that it actually was Nicholson. It was really cold outside, so when they shot this, Jack was packed with hot water bottles under his costume. And his head was also braced to hold him absolutely still. And he needed to remain motionless for a lot longer than the shot in the finished film, because originally it was a long, slow, very slow zoom in to Jack's face from a wide shot, as seen here. Garrett Brown stood next to the camera with a pair of binoculars so he could let Stanley know if Jack had moved or blinked. <laughs> In the finished film, when we cut to Frozen Jack, you can actually feel the last couple of frames of that zoom coming to a, uh, to a stop. This is Nicholson's stand-in Jack Dearlove modeling an early test of Jack's frozen makeup. It was created with melted candle wax. A fun little side trip before I tell my last story. I actually own the Apollo 11 sweater that Danny wears in The Shining. I had an opportunity to buy it many years ago. It had been purchased in a sale at the end of production by Jill Smith, the first assistant editor. She bought it for her young nephew who quickly outgrew it and then it sat in her closet for decades before I got it. I've since loaned it long term to the Kubrick exhibit, so it's been off traveling the world. Before I gave it to them though, I had to take advantage of a unique opportunity. My youngest son, Max, was five years old, same age as Danny when he wore it in the movie. So, of course, I had to do this. <laughs> <laughs> the sweater had gotten kind of stiff, so Max was not at all happy to put it on for the photo. He said, fine, but I'm not gonna smile. I said, perfect. <laughs> Max is 18 now and he just started college and the sweater sadly no longer fits him. Okay, so here's one last story before I show you the book. This is one of the Lloyd's photos. That's Danny's brother Mike to the left and Vivian Kubrick with her back to us. I had learned to identify pretty much every crew member by name, but I didn't know who that man was with the mustache. I just figured he was just some random guy. A few years later, I was sitting with Leon Vitale showing him photos. I found that showing people photos when I could 
often triggered memories and stories that they might not have mentioned otherwise. And when Leon saw this one, he said, oh, you know who that guy is? It's Werner Herzog. <laughs> and he then told me this amazing story. <laughs> Apparently Herzog had been visiting Nicholson to talk about a potential project. And Werner was on the set when Kubrick was filming Danny riding around on his trike. After the first couple of takes, Kubrick was concerned about the jarring difference between the sound of the trike going over the wooden floor and the sound of it going over the carpets. He said, I don't know if that's working. Can we dampen it somehow? Should we pull up the, uh, the rugs? And Werner chimed in and said, actually, I think it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> and Kubrick listened to a playback on headphones and he agreed. It's a great example of Stanley being open to input and ideas from other people. Most people think he was a control freak, but Kubrick could often be quite collaborative. So several years after starting this project, and around the time that Jonathan finished his writing of the first draft of the text, I approached Tashin. We had wanted to work with Tashin from the very beginning, because they had previously published three beautiful Kubrick books. The Stanley Kubrick Archives, which I mentioned earlier, followed by a book about Stanley's Unmade Napoleon Project, mm. and more recently, a book on the making of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Both the Napoleon book and the 2001 book had been designed by a firm called M.M. Paris. M.M. consisted of designers Mikhail Amzalag and Matthias Agustiniak. I figured if I had them on board before even approaching Tashin, it would hopefully help secure Tashin's interest. I met with Mikhail and Matthias, and they were immediately intrigued with the challenge of designing this book. They came up with what I thought was a great concept, one that would honor what I knew was going to be a lengthy text while showcasing all of these amazing photos we had. And it was this concept that I sent to Tashin with my book proposal. Tashin was interested, and so I had lunch with Benedict Tashin to tell him more about the project. I cautioned that it was going to be a very text-heavy book, not the kind of book Tashin typically publishes. I promised it would have plenty of amazing images, though, and if we were going to do the book together, he would have to be okay with lots of text as well. This was meant to be the definitive book on the making of The Shining, after all. Thankfully, the idea of a text-heavy book didn't scare Benedict off, and he fully supported the book as we envisioned it. So now, after a decade of work, we have the first edition of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, the collector's edition. It's a numbered edition. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Mm. It's a numbered edition of 1,000 copies. It comes in a huge box, and it weighs 42 and a half pounds. Oh, Let's take a look at what's inside. When you open the box, you're wow. greeted by a couple of things. There's a certificate inside the lid that has each book's edition number, and at the upper level of the box is an oversized scrapbook. Our scrapbook was, of course, inspired by the same scrapbook that Kubrick filmed and then abandoned. Since The Shining is a ghost story, Mikael and Matthias wanted to embrace the prop scrapbook as a ghostly item that left echoes behind in the film. When you first open the scrapbook, you find a series of pages with articles that recount the sordid and violent history of the Overlook. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the actual prop scrapbook that Kubrick filmed no longer exists. So using a combination of remnants left behind in the archive, as well as my own imagination, I created all of these scrapbook pages myself. I worked really hard to capture the quality and verisimilitude that Stanley would have demanded from whoever crafted the original. As you flip through the pages, you start to discover articles that seem to have vanished. We wanted it to feel like taking down a framed photo that had been hanging on the wall of a house for many decades. Each missing article leaves a ghostly echo behind. And as you page forward, more and more articles go missing until you're finally faced with nothing but blank spots where articles used to be. And you then arrive at the meat of the book, which is nearly 450 pages of images, one photo per page. Some are behind the scenes stills, others are deleted shots. And rather than putting the images in production order, I instead organized the images according to their sequence in the film. I did some back of the napkin math and across the three volumes that make up the collector's edition, around 75% of the images have never been published. Nice. And of that 75%, a significant portion had never been seen by more than a handful of people. When you remove the scrapbook from the box, you find another volume nestled down on the second level. When you remove it, it resembles a box of typing paper, inspired by Jack's typing paper in the film. When you take the lid off, you find Jack's all work and no play manuscript. We've included scanned facsimiles of all 114 of the original pages. 
Now, most of the pages were hand typed by Stanley's secretary, Margaret Adams, on an old manual typewriter. Cooper told her to do them crazily and to make mistakes. A few of the pages were typed by a young American production assistant named Zach Weinstein, who remembers some pages taking him as long as an hour and a half to type. When I interviewed Zach, he told me that he remembered hiding his name on one page, <laughs> hoping that Kubrick wouldn't notice. Well, I found that page, and I sent him a copy 40 years after he typed it. <laughs> when you remove the typed pages from the box, you find several other bits of ephemera, three softbound booklets and a continuity script. While researching the book, I got in touch with Stanley's daughter, Vivian, and one item she shared with me was a continuity script that had been given to her by script supervisor June Randall at the end of production. When it arrived in the mail, I just about died. It was so amazing. And Vivian gave us permission to create an exact facsimile of that entire script for the collector's edition. The script is packed with June's notes. It's also filled with continuity Polaroids that have been glued into the script. Stanley often rewrote pages on the set, writing new dialogue that came out of rehearsals. In Vivian's documentary, you can see him typing away on a little typewriter. Those bits of new dialogue straight out of Stanley's typewriter are taped into the script. You can also see old dialogue that was abandoned before ever filming. It's an incredible piece of film history. And when I got it from Vivian, one of my first thoughts was, it's too bad people won't be able to see this whole thing. Well, you can. <laughs> The next item in the box is a booklet of Saul Bass sketches. Kubrick first met the renowned graphic designer on Spartacus, where Bass had designed the title sequence. Stanley reached out to Saul and asked him to design a title treatment for The Shining. And this booklet gathers nearly all of Saul's sketches as he worked his way toward the final design. Most of them have never been seen before, not even by Stanley Kubrick. Saul sent only a handful to Stanley that he deemed worthy of review. So most of these are being seen for the very first time, thanks to the generosity of Saul's daughter, Jennifer, and the Saul Bass Archive at the Academy Library. The next item in the box is a collection of early production design sketches. I discovered these sketches very late in the process. The Kubricks had found a box labeled The Shining that hadn't been turned over to the archive. <laughs> and I happened to show up, and no one had looked in the box yet, but the archive let me go through it. I found some amazing stuff, including these drawings, the only known concept sketches created for the film. They included drawings of the Overlook's exterior and the lobby and the Colorado Lounge, and we've re reproduced most of them in this softbound booklet. The final item in the ephemera box is a booklet filled with caricatures of The Shining's cast and crew. They were drawn by makeup artist Tom Smith, who was often seen sketching during his downtime on the set. And here's a few of them. <laughs> I think they're really awesome. Wow. You can see a little dog behind Shelly's foot, and that was her puppy, Tapinski, who stayed up in Shelly's dressing room while she worked, along with her two parakeets. When the fire broke out on stage three, Shelly raced upstairs with a stagehand to rescue them. Once Tom finished his drawings, he made up a bunch of bound copies that he then gave out to the cast and crew. I got a hold of one, and we've reproduced most of them in this booklet, along with a key so that you know who everyone is. And that's everything in the ephemera box. Underneath the ephemera box, you'll find the final volume in the collector's edition. It's the smallest of the three volumes, but the most dense. The book contains the complete story of the making of The Shining. It's bound in soft red vinyl, and it's 910 pages long. <laughs> we wanted the book to be hand-holdable, not something you had to lay on a table to read. While it's very text-heavy, it's also filled with loads of unique photos and documents. It's not only an exhaustive day-by-day -day account of the making of the film, but it also shares many new insights into Kubrick, both as a director and as a person, via sidebars that are spread throughout the book. So between this and the other volumes, I have included pretty much every last image that I found interesting from my decades of research and discoveries. It's the book I always wanted to see in the world, but it didn't exist. And I can't wait to get it into the hands of everyone who loves The Shining. Aww. So here's the complete contents of the collector's edition. Three volumes, 2,198 pages, 42 and a half pounds. <laughs>